Okay, good evening everyone, and thank you for coming out on a first more or less cold evening of the year, so it's uh, good to see a good crowd of people. Um, so as Jonathan said, I'm going to be talking about genetics in a fairly general sense, but um, without too much technical content, but showing how we can apply genetic data to a conservation project that I've been working on for more years than I care to think of. It's certainly more than 30, but it's, uh, it's a, a nice long-term project, which is something which is a, um, a luxury that those of us who aren't in universities can actually think about because we're not on quite the same rigid three-year cycle of projects. So um, without further ado, I'll start. So I'm, the main theme that I'm going to be talking about this evening is the long-term project on whether or not we can bring back the native lady slipper orchid from the, the verge of extinction in the UK. Um, the, the painting on the right-hand side is by one of our very fine botanical artists at Kew Christabel, who is somebody I've had the joy of working with for many years. And she did this painting of the, of the species for us a few years ago for one of our papers on the subject. However, I'm not going to start off talking about plants for a minute. I'm going to drop back to something a little bit more personal and talk about humans. And how many people in the audience have done one of the DNA-based um, tests for finding out where you come from and who you are and who you're related to? So several people in the audience. But um, So a few years ago, I did the ancestry one, and that grew out of an interest that I had in my own family tree. Um, and I thought I knew what my geographical origins were, but I was interested in trying to find out something about DNA that I shared with other people, finding out something about, from that about predicted relationships, and also for one particular reason to find out something about shared ancestors. And the reason I wanted to find out about shared ancestors um, relates to the fact that I have a very rare surname. My grandmother, her maiden name was Emanson, and there is only one family with that surname. So the overall um, percentages weren't any surprise. My father was half Irish, and I end up being more or less a quarter Irish, so it's exactly what I expected. Um, but here's my great-grandparents, and this is Joseph Emanson and his wife Henrietta. Um, and I like to think that this is Joseph worrying about extinction, not of a rare plant in Yorkshire, but of a rare Yorkshire surname. Um, he had 11 children, including my grandmother, and had almost no grandchildren. So with every generation, the name hovers on the ex edge of extinction. But we also were trying to work out who these Emonsons were. So from 19, sorry, 1837 onwards, of course, there was compulsory registration of births, deaths and marriages. So you can get a lot of information from the certificates that went with that. And so here's my great-grandfather's birth certificate with the name of his parents. So we've got great-grandfather Joseph and his father also Joseph. Tells you where... They came from and what he did, he was a stonemason. But before 1837, the records get a lot more patchy. And so you rely on things like parish records and other documents. But because it's such a rare surname, there was only one Joseph who could be this man here. And we found out that his parents were Samuel and Anne. Going back further than that um, becomes increasingly problematic because of the patchiness of the records. But we've got a genetic bottleneck in the family because it turns out that all of the living Emonsons are descendants of this couple here. None of the brothers, none of the cousins had male children that carried on the family surname. Which means that 
in the 1921 census, all Lehmansons in that were my mother's fourth cousins or closer. So it really is a very rare surname. And there were only 38 people in the 1921 census. So going back further than that, there's a, a book of um, Yorkshire genealogies, printed genealogies, and here's one for the Emonsons of Seacroft. And tantalizingly, there was a Samuel here, there's a Samuel here, there's a Samuel here, and a Samuel here. But the dates never quite matched, and so we were left sort of wondering whether or not any of these Samuels were actually my Samuel, um, or whether or not these were just other relatives, or maybe not even related at all. So my big question before DNA was, was that my Samuel? So then when I did the Ancestry DNA, one of my matches was this person, Joanne, who turns out to be a very distant cousin. We're not quite sure whether she's a ninth or a tenth cousin, once or twice removed, but it uh, amazes me that with less than 1% of shared DNA, for the bits that they look at, which is 10 centimorgans for the geneticists in the audience, and that's only out of all of the chromosomes that we have, we just share one little bit of DNA on one chromosome. So we share a tiny amount of DNA. But her family tree was rather better documented than mine, and she had these two ancestors called Joshua and his daughter Mary Emonson. And that allows us then to go back from the late 1700s to the early 1600s, because if you look at that genealogy again, here's Joshua and his daughter Mary. And Joanne is descended from this Joshua here. What it still means is that we don't know which of the Samuels is mine, which is why I say my ninth or my tenth cousin, because we're not quite sure how the generations fit together yet, because the paperwork isn't there. But it does, does allow me to tie my Samuel in somehow into this family tree. So it was a personal sort of um, way which genetics has um, you know, allowed me to answer a question. And, of course, the, the human genetics has been helped hugely by things like the Human Genome Project um, and the speed of, with which the genetics... Um, DNA sequencing has been increasing, and so we can now do an awful lot of things with human genetics that we couldn't do even 10 or 20 years ago. So th that was an example of how you might look at a rare surname using genetics. And now I'd like to go on to talking about the main subject of this evening, which is whether or not understanding the genetics of a rare plant can help you conserve it. So why is the lady's slipper orchid rare in the, in the UK? Well, one, one reason is that it was always rare. Um, it's really a rather more continental species, um, and it only ever really just crept into Britain. It was never in any of the other countries apart from England, and it was only ever in the north of England on, on limestone. So it's limited by climate, because it doesn't like this western margin climate, and it's limited because of the types of soils that it can grow on. And then it was affected by habitat loss, uh, the conversion of land to farmland, but also because several hundred individuals were collected and taken into herbaria and museum collections. And of course, as a botanist, herbaria are incredibly important. They're the foundation of nearly everything that we do because we like to be able to go back to dried plant specimens so that we know where they come from, what they look like, and so that we have a type specimen for every plant species so you can go back and make sure that your individual matches the type specimen. However, there was a what I like to refer to as stamp collecting mentality in the 19th century, early 20th century, when every regional herbarium and every regional museum wanted one of everything. 
even if they didn't really need it. They just wanted it because of everybody else had one. And so you can type in Cypripedium calceolus herbarium, and you get pictures like this from regional herbaria around the UK, and everybody wanted one. And some of them thought one wasn't enough, so they went out and collected four and stuck them all on one sheet. So you can see that for a plant that was already rare, to then collect several hundred of them and put them onto paper gives you a permanent record of where they used to grow, but it's a, one of the main reasons why it's on the verge of extinction. However, as N Napoleon said that we were a nation of shopkeepers and gardeners, and so in, in addition to collecting plants to dry them, we, people went out and collected living plants and took them into their gardens. And so in addition to all these dead plants on paper, there were several plants which were in protective custody rather than stamp collecting, which were growing in people's gardens. But by the early part of the 20th century, it was thought to be extinct in the wild, and there were several plants that were of known wild origin in people's collections, um, but no plants that people could go and see actually in nature. So, it's a widespread species. It occurs all the way from northern England all the way across to the east coast of Asia in temperate regions. But it was never common in the UK. It's collected to near extinction for the reasons I've discussed. And by 1917, it was actually thought to be extinct. But then in the 1930s, somebody found one plant on a lonely hillside in Yorkshire. So it takes me back to my Emonsons and the rarity. Over the years, that was kept a deep, dark secret, and there was a very select group of people that knew where the plant grew. But then, by the 1970s, they decided they needed to do something rather more serious about trying to conserve it. And so they set up a thing called the Cypripedium Committee, and there's been somebody from Kew on that committee since the 1970s. Then, in the 1980s, Sir Robert and Lady Sainsbury gave a large grant to Kew to... Um, set up a project looking at the conservation of native orchids, including the Lady Slipper Orchid. And that's still running to date. And then that led, in the 1990s, to some early reintroduction. And I've put re in brackets because some of them are introduction and some of them are reintroduction because they, some of the plants were put out into what we thought might be suitable environment where there hadn't actually previously been Lady Slipper orchids recorded. So it's not strictly a reintroduction. This quote I like here, that it was greed that swept away the Lady Slipper orchid um, from Gaythorne Hardy in the 1930s. It's a, it's a wonderful book, which is I use for quotes for all sorts of things, not just for Lady Slipper orchids. Then one of the main, the main question that the committee asked was, whether or not the Lady Slipper Orchid could be saved. Um, was it something that we were just going to have as a historical record that this plant used to occur in the UK? And one of the first questions they were asking then was whether or not there was any native stock available, and if so, what? There was the, the plant at the, the wild site that was rediscovered in the 1930s, and I say the plant, but it was always a little bit of an open question as to whether there was more than one genetically different individual there, because nobody wanted to dig it up to find out whether these various shoots were connected to each other underground. Um, and then in addition to that, there were six plants that were growing in gardens that were the ones that, some of which were definitely collected in the early 1900s and taken into this protective custody. Um, Going back to my paper trail of the Emonsons, my branch of the Emonsons isn't very good. Joanne's was much better than mine, so she ties back into that genealogy that was published. One of the big questions was whether or not all the plants in cultivation were native. Going back to Napoleon, one of the, with us being a nation of gardeners, people had been bringing plants to the UK from elsewhere, and so there was some 
suggestion that some of these plants may have actually come from elsewhere throughout the, the wide range of this species. And then where does genetics come into it? How many of those are genetically distinct from each other? And that's because there's a possibility that some of them were due to seed germination and seedlings developing from those and some of them from vegetative divisions from the original plants. Oops. Let's change the format of that slightly. Sorry, there's a, a letters over. So... In terms of propagation, which is one of the parts of what Q's been involved in in the last 30 years, um, you need to go back and talk a little bit about the biology of orchids because orchids are one of the largest plant families, but they're also one of the weirdest plant families. There's um, somewhere around 28,000 species of orchids worldwide. Um, they fascinated people like Charles Darwin, Joseph Hooker, who was the director of Kew, who was a good friend of Darwin's in the 19th century. Um, but they have a very weird set of characteristics that make them fascinating to people like me, but they also make them difficult to conserve, conserve in some cases and cause some particular issues. And one of those is that the, the seeds, which the several people in the Victorian times loved to draw different orchid seeds because they were wonderful shapes and sizes. Well, most of them were tiny, but there were some which produced these much larger, rather ornate seeds. But the, the main thing about them is that they have a seed coat and then a sim simple embryo in there without any food reserves. Um, so if you germinate a broad bean seed, you get two seed leaves or cotyledons, which have enough food in them to allow the plant to grow to a certain stage so that it can start producing its own food by photosynthesis. Orchids have said, let's get, move away from needing that and let's find a different way of feeding ourselves. And so these seeds, which have no nutrient reserves, are infected by a fungus in nature. And then the fungus thinks it's going to eat the embryo, but it ends up with the embryo eating the fungus and getting its nutrients from that. The seeds are tiny, so you can see here a centimetre scale, and these structures here are orchid seeds. And it fascinated Darwin because not only are the seeds tiny, but they're produced in huge numbers. And there's this quote from Darwin that... Um, the heath-spotted orchid, Dactyliza maculata, from a single capsule on a, on a plant in one generation, if every seed germinated, they would cover an acre, and then the great-grandchildren of that one would cover the whole surface of the earth in a continuous carpet of green. And so Darwin said, well, hang on a minute, why are some orchids rare? They produce all these thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds, um, and it was one of the things that, really puzzled him, and he wrote a book about orchids um, in which he talked about some of these issues. So this dependence on the, the mycorrhizal fungi for germination um, limits the seed germination nature because if a seed lands somewhere where that fungus isn't present, then the seeds don't germinate and grow. But you, if you use in vitro techniques, so in the laboratory, you can overcome the need for the fungus by growing orchid seeds of many species on a nutrient agar, which has got minerals and sugars and other compounds in it. Um, so you end up with an orchid plant, but without the fungus. In the case of Cypripedium and Calceolus, the latest slipper orchid, and a number of other species, another complication is that they go into a very strong dormancy when the capsules are mature, and so that then you get a very gradual germination of the seeds over a number of years. But it means that when you try and germinate them on agar jelly, that you end up with a very low percentage germination if you use seeds from mature capsules. So here's a mature capsule, and if you tried to germinate these seeds, you would end up with a very low success rate. So people gradually, through the Sainsbury Orchid Project at Kew, 
found out that if you took, rather than mature capsules, if you took young capsules, or rather immature green capsules like this, and cut them open, you ended up with these seeds here, which weren't fully formed. But if you then tried to germinate those on agar jelly, that you got a much better rate of germination. And we, we work with the people who look after the, the wild plants and the plants in cultivation to make sure that they develop the pods for the right number of days before they send them to queue for germination. So you collect green capsules from the plant and then put them on agar jelly and you can see here some seeds which are, even though you took a green capsule, some of them were too mature to germinate and here's one that's just beginning to germinate and then they produce these strange structures which are another characteristic of orchids called protocorms um, which are the young seedlings of orchids. You can see here that unlike most plants then they don't have any chlorophyll in them or very little chlorophyll so they're not doing anything by way of photosynthesis at this stage. Growing them on on the jelly, you can then end up with structures that look like this. So a seedling which is beginning to produce some roots and a little hint of a shoot here. But then they stop and they, don't, they just sit there, not growing any further. And we discovered almost by mistake, because we had too many of these things sitting there not doing anything, that we said, OK, where? we'll put some of them in a fridge because then we'll have to subculture them and transfer them to fresh jelly less frequently. And some of them were put into a fridge and lo and behold, when you do that, they start growing. And that's because it turns out that even when you grow them in jars on an agar jelly, that they actually need to go through a winter to move on to that next stage. And then we end up with shelf after shelf after shelf of lady slipper orchid seedlings. So then we've got these seedlings in jars that are beginning to produce shoots, which are growing quite nicely, thank you. And then we, in the 1990s, we set, started sending batches of these back up to the north of England for them to be reintroduced into nature. But we hit the next problem, was that when you put these seedlings out into nature, 95 or 100, nearly 100% 100 of them died because they were too small to survive. And so now what happens is that they're grown on in pots by a, a number of people who are associated with the Cypripedium Committee, the Lady Slipper Orchid Committee in the north of England. So they're already becoming acclimatised to the climate where they're going to be planted out. And they're grown on for several more years in pots before they're large enough to be planted out. And the good news about that is that if you do that, then you end up with nearly 100% survival rate when you put them back into the ground. We then end up with 17 sites plus reinforcement of the plants at the wild site. So we've now got 18 sites in the north of England where we've got living plants of Cypripedium calceolus. And the good news is that in the 1990s, the first of the reintroduced plants began to flower and we've now had flowering plants at 11 of those sites. They use some of the sites as honeypot sites, so that these are sites which are publicised to take the pressure off the the truly wild site, which is actually on private land. And we don't want too many people going there, trampling it, compacting the soil, damaging the plants. And so these, some of these sites, um, we encourage people to go to those so that they can actually see Cypripedium calceolus flowering in, in Britain. Despite that, unfortunately, we still need to have a certain degree of protection at some of those sites. And at one of the honeypot sites a few years ago, somebody went in there and, and pulled all the shoots out of the ground. So, you know, there are still some crazy people around there who really want to destroy what we have. So then, two questions that we still really haven't answered, uh, in this talk at least, uh, what about the genetics? What does that tell us? And one which we think about quite a lot is whether or not the lack of a fungal partner matters because these are seedlings which have been grown without the fungus. So they're still not really quite how they would be in nature. So 
natural England or English nature as it was at that stage in the early 1990s came and spoke to us and said, okay, we've worked out how to propagate this plant, but now we want to know something about the genetic background of the plants that we're producing, which ones are appropriate for planting out, is everything native? And they had a whole series of questions, some of which are up on this slide here. In terms of making a robust reintroduced population, we wanted to make sure that it had some genetic variability. Um, so one of the first questions was whether or not the plants were genetically distinguishable from each other. Because it's such a widespread species, we were also interested in whether or not the plants in the UK were different from the ones elsewhere throughout the range. And we also wanted to know which plants we'd produce through this propagation should be put back into nature. And some of the plants that are in cultivation in the UK, with the ones, some of these ones with the rather dodgy paper trail, um, there was a potential that they weren't actually British plants at all. And so one of the questions that Natural England said to us was, OK, can you tell us which ones you think are English and which ones aren't? But then that led to a series of supplementary questions because we immediately hit some problems. Um, one of those, or a series of those questions, relate to the fact that the latest super orchid has a huge genome. Um, it's almost 10 times the size of the human genome. Um, so you've got an awful lot of DNA there to work with. Um, but even within the slipper orchids, this is a relative of our native lady slipper orchid. This is one from Mexico, Cypripedium molly. And that one has, if you, these are picograms of DNA in a haploid nucleus. And you can see that it's got eight times more DNA. But it's not because of polyploidy, which is something that people always talk about when you've got multiple sets of chromosomes. Many people assume that if you've got large genomes in plants, it's due to polyploidy. Cypripedium calceolus has 20 chromosomes. Cypripedium molly has 20 chromosomes. It's just that they have big sausages instead of chromosomes. Um, so there you've got 32. If you compare the human genome, it's about 3.5 picograms. So if you think about something like the Human Genome Project, where people have now sequenced the whole genome. If you've only got three and a half picograms of DNA to sequence, if you've got 10 times that amount of DNA, then of course it's a much different scale of a problem for sequencing it. It's also a problem when you come to trying to do genetic fingerprinting to try and work out the relationships within a species. So one of the techniques that we used to use in the 1990s, early 2000s, was a technique called AFLP, which stands for Amplified Fragment Length Polymorphisms. Um, you don't need to worry exactly what that means, but it, you basically chop up all of the DNA in an organism into small pieces, and then you look at those different pieces. Um, when it works nicely, so here's an example from another very rare orchid in the UK. This is the fen orchid, which has a genome about twice the size of the human genome, instead of eight times or ten times. And you end up with a, a more or less flat baseline, and then these peaks are fragments of DNA which are of different lengths. So the, the scale on the top here is the number of base pairs. So here you've got a piece of DNA which is 115 base pairs long, which is present in this individual, but it's not present in that individual. And when these uh, when you use this technique, what you want to have is a mixture of some shared bands of DNA, pieces of DNA, and some which in some individuals, but not in others, so you can begin to work out patterns of relationships. So with the fen orchid, it worked beautifully. So here we've got, even in the very small population that we have in the UK, we found some bands that were in this individual, and this one here's got two bands, and here it's only got one. So even within another rare species of orchid which had been through a similar bottleneck, then we end up with some differences and some similarities. When we started doing, trying to do the same thing with Cypripedium calceolus, you can see here we end up with this very messy baseline, and then we end up with a few peaks here, these three peaks and two here. Not only are they present in the wild plant, 
and we've got the left-hand side and the right-hand side because, as I said, nobody wanted to dig the plant up to find out whether it was two individuals or one, so they wanted us to take a small piece of leaf tissue and test those. And here's one of the cultivated plants from the UK, but here's a plant from Germany. So these five peaks here, these fragments of DNA, are present in not only the English plants, but they're also present in ones from elsewhere on the continent. So instead of having this nice pattern of shared bands and different bands, we end up with something which is, to all intents and purposes, uninterpretable. And when we put in other species which had genomes between this size and this size, we found that you got this gradual shift from nice traces to uninterpretable traces. Here it looks like we've basically got very little variation because the, the peaks that you can I interpret are present in all individuals. But we were left with this nagging doubt as to whether or not the, the lack of variation was just actually an artifact and whether or not that was due to the problem with genome size. So then we moved on to a different technique. This is nuclear microsatellites, which is something that was um, similar to the techniques that we use for human forensics. So if you want to find out whether a particular person committed a crime or whether this man was the father of that child in a paternity trial, it's a similar sort of technique to ones that we use with humans. And again, we, we did a lot of work on this. Or I say we, what I mean is one of my students did a lot of work. She started doing a lot of DNA cloning and sequencing. She found 27 regions that had these microsatellites, which are these length variable regions of DNA, so that you can tell differences between individuals by looking at the length variation. When she tried to use those, she found out of those 27, that 16 of them, she could actually get them to amplify well, which is part of the process that we go. But then when she looked at those, six of them showed no variation and eight of them were almost impossible to score, which left her with two that were actually variable and possible to score. So if you look at the starting off with 200 and get down to two, she wasn't very happy at the end of several months of hard work. Um, so we published a paper on the effect of genome size. So this was the... Um, the silver lining, if you like, because although we didn't get the answers that we wanted about the latest slipper orchid, we were able to publish a paper to say that genome size had a strong effect on, a strong negative effect on the quality of AFLPs. And then a, a couple of years before that, Trent and Garner, and a geneticist in the US, published a paper showing that genome size um, also had a bad effect on the utility of microsatellites, this other technique that we tried to use. And the group that he was looking at were mainly amphibians, which are another group which, of organisms which have a large variation in genome size. Um, but it turns out that um, in amphibians they have the same problem. So we were left scratching our heads because at the time that was, we didn't have the resources that people had um, when they were working on the human genome, for example. We didn't have the millions and billions of dollars that were available for projects like that. We were left trying to find out what technique we could actually use for delving into the genetics of Cypripedium calceolus. And one thing, um, those of you who know anything about human genetics or animal genetics will know about the mitochondrial genome, which is a small circular chromosome in the mitochondria in a cell. Um, plants uh, have a, an extra small circular chromosome because they also have one in the chloroplasts and the other types of plastids. And the benefit of this is that it doesn't vary in genome size very much. There's a two or three-fold variation in genome size of the plastid genome or the chloroplast genome, um, whereas there's a several thousand-fold variation in terms of the nuclear genome, the, the main chromosomes of the, the plant. So 
that means you can escape from the problems of genome size. And so here, you end up with one peak for each individual. Uh, again, these are the number of base pairs along the top. And so we've got, with this same piece of DNA that we've pulled out of the plastid genome, we've got ones that are 198 base pairs long, we've got ones that are 204. So we thought, great, we've actually got some variation. And we had, this is just one example, we had a number of these sites within the plastid genome. But then when we actually sort of started delving into the data, we had some common Western European ones, which included the English ones. The, we did actually answer one of our questions, and that was that the putatively non-native plants, the ones that we thought might have been introduced from somewhere else, instead of having these co common Western European ones, had different lengths of DNA for this particular fragment. Um, when we, one of them was all, no matter how many of these we looked at, and we had a number of these different sites, um, when we looked into it, every single time we looked at it, it had a different size fragment. And it was sort of, it, we couldn't sort of work out why it was always so different. So we then went back to a different technique of DNA sequencing and compared it with other species of Cypripedium, Lady Slipper Orchid, and it turns out that it wasn't actually even our native Lady Slipper Orchid. It was a very similar looking species, but one with brown and yellow flowers, but which grows in North America. And somebody had brought one of these plants from North America and had planted it out in Britain thinking it was the native lady slipper orchid, and it turned out it wasn't even the native lady slipper orchid. So this one here isn't actually the native species. So good news is that they're scorable. We only get one peak per individual, but at least we've got some information. Like mitochondrial DNA, it's inherited from one parent. So this is... Um, not necessarily very useful because it, it tells you, we know that in, in, in orchids, like in most flowering plants, that it's inherited from the maternal parent. So it tells you something about mum, but it tells you nothing about dad. So it doesn't tell you anything about where the pollen came from that gave rise to the seeds that gave rise to those plants. So we found some variation, but as I said, there were these common Western European variants which weren't, there wasn't sufficient variation to actually tell us or answers to all the questions. So then we were delighted about a decade later when suddenly as a result of next generation sequencing, we came across a whole series of papers, one after another, and this is just a small selection of them, where people had speeded up the discovery of some of these markers um, that we wanted to use. So SSR is sim simple sequence repeats, which is another word for nuclear microsatellites. Um, and so we thought, great. So we found some money from somewhere and said, we're going to do some of this next generation sequencing and it's going to solve all of our problems. And the good news is that we now have a set of 12 polymorphic variable microsatellites, which we use. We've got more than 12, but we only need to use 12 of them because if we use more than 12, we don't discover any more unique genotypes, uh, genetically distinct individuals. And we know that, that when we include samples from elsewhere, that we also, 12 is sufficient for us to be able to um, identify all of the different genetic variants. We were also able to say, okay, each of those plants that we think are native plants, so there's the, the one on the lonely hillside in Yorkshire, plus the half dozen that were in gardens. Each of those has a, an individually recognizable genotype. So we can, we know exactly which plant the leaf, so if somebody gives me a sample of leaf tissue from a plant in the UK, I can tell you which plant it came from. And 
people who grow these plants on occasionally lose labels and they've come back to us and said, we're terribly sorry, but we don't know which, par which were the parents of this particular seedling. So we can then go back and say, okay, give us a bit of leaf tissue and we can then tell them which label to put back in that pot. We hope they don't do that too, too often because it costs us money to do that, but we can actually do it. Um, and then if we get to the stage where seedlings start appearing at the wild site or at the reintroduction sites, then we'll be able to say what the father and the mother of those plants were. And so because it's part of the nuclear genome, you can end up with, it's a diploid plant with two sets of chromosomes. So here's an example where on the same fragment of DNA is a different length on the two chromosomes, two sets of chromosomes. In the, whereas this one's got, on both of the chromosomes, it's the same length, so you only end up with, with one. The, the, because of um, the technique that we use, you end up with this, what they call a stutter peak, which is just an artifact, so you can ignore that little one beforehand. So you end up with one main peak, and here one main peak, and here one main peak. So you can tell the difference between what we call homozygotes with two copies of the same, heterozygotes with two different copies, and here's a different heterozygote with it's got two copies, but they're not the same as these two copies. And then here at the bottom, you've got one which is, for this particular marker, is indistinguishable the second and the fourth one are indistinguishable from each other. So you can begin to get a handle on how closely or distantly things are related to each other. So when you've got a lot of data, and we've been collecting plants from across the range of the species, each you, get, you can put together the various bits of information from each of these particular nuclear microsatellites and then you can run it through various programs. This one's the output from a program called Structure, which looks, as the name suggests, it looks for genetic structure within and between populations. And then the outputs come with different colors, um, which it says, so here you've got a green cluster of close related individuals. Here you've got red ones and blue and yellow ones. So in this particular case, across Western Europe, as far across as Estonia, it's got red, yellow, green, and blue population. So it says there's four main groups within Western Europe with this particular level of sampling. So you've got a, a, each column is one individual. And here you see you've got an individual here which is predominantly from the red lineage, but it's got a little bit of the blue and a little bit of the yellow. Here you've got a green one, one which is particularly predominantly green, but it's got a tiny bit of blue and a little bit of yellow. So there's some mixture between these main genetic clusters. Um, but one thing that surprised us about these results was that when we looked at them, despite the fact we'd been down to this tiny number of plants in the UK, that we'd actually ended up maintaining some genetic variability. So we've got representatives of the red, the blue, and the yellow lineages. So this, these are the UK ones. If you compare those to Denmark, where there are two populations, but each of those populations has more than 200 individual plants in them, there's very little variation. Nearly all the plants in Denmark that we've looked at are pure green. And this is just a subset of the individuals from those two populations. So you can't look at the size of a population and say, OK, we've got lots of plants and therefore it must be genetically a healthy population because in, in, in some of these cases you end up with very few um, genetic variants, whereas for random reasons, for stochastic reasons, we've ended up with maintaining some genetic variability within the plants in the UK. So we've got evidence of three original lineages in England there's a, some degree of mixing between those three. The yellow and the blue ones, here you've got them in Germany, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, France and Estonia, so those are widespread Western European lineages. But we've got the, the red one, which is 
you've little hints of it elsewhere, but you get these ones here in, in the UK, which are solidly red. Um, in Denmark, you've got these ones here, which are more or less solidly green. And again, you've got tiny hints of green else, elsewhere. Oops. So we were left sort of wondering where these red lineages and green lineages come from. There are gaps in our sampling, and that's because of extinction. Um, if you look um, at maps of the historical distribution of the latest Saproket, it used to occur in northern France, it used to occur in Belgium and in Luxembourg, for example, but it's extinct in all those places now. So maybe these red and green lineages used to occur there, but we'll probably never know. Um, but we still do have some gaps in our sampling. We've been working hard at, with colleagues from around the range of the species, and we've got some samples from most countries where it occurs, but obviously we haven't captured all the variation. Then Roberta, who's in the audience, my co-author and colleague of several years, and has been doing some wonderful taking these genetic data and doing clever things with them. Um, and one of the things that she's looked at is sp the spread across the range of it. And so she's got plants here for, um, when we were still allowed to work with colleagues from Russia. And unfortunately, at the moment, that's a bit problematic for the reasons that we all know. Um, but a colleague in, in Moscow had been looking at um, the pop population structure and the ecology of Cypripedium calceolus across its range in Russia, and she was desperate for somebody to collect some genetic data. And so we said, okay, if you send us the samples, we can do the genetics and we can hopefully find some interesting things out about that. So here you've got many of our samples, of course, in Western and Northwestern Europe, and you've got this sort of predominantly, in the colors in this one are slightly different, so you've got a predominantly Southwestern yellow lineage, and then it's sort of Northeastern green, lineage and here's the northeastern green lineage so it goes all the way across there but then when you get into central asia and further east in asia you end up with this purple lineage which isn't represented um, in western europe so there's this what looks to be a, a real sort of genetic break here a very clear break whereas it, it's rather more complex pattern in, in western europe and so Roberta then asked the question about whether or not these patterns reflect something about the history through the various glaciations. And so she did some modeling. So here you've got different time slices, so the Holocene, the last glacial maximum, and the last interglacial here. And during the last glacial maximum, you can see that this dark color disappears in Central Asia here. And that's because the climate was unsuitable for the latest slipper orchid in that whole area. So during the last glacial maximum, there was a whole area here where the plants were unable to grow. And so our hypothesis here is that these purple ones here that are now in Central Asia were pushed down into a refugium somewhere in East Asia, and then they've gradually been able to expand back out in further west. But you've got this very distinct split in the species between the, the Far Eastern ones and then the Western ones. So the other thing we can do as a result of um, the generosity of our colleagues elsewhere throughout the range is that we can help them um, begin to approach questions relating to conservation. And so we've, we've worked with colleagues in Denmark, for example, on these two large populations, because they, they said, okay, we've got two large populations, but we have only got two populations, so what should we be doing with them? So we've been able to talk to them about the fact that they've got very little genetic variability in the Danish ones, which means that basically they don't have to worry too much because it doesn't matter which plants they collect seeds from because they basically get the same genetic background. Um, but then Roberta is from Italy and so she, was, she did a lot of work with some of her Italian colleagues and they've come up with this whole set of guidelines for conservation action in Italy where you've got some 
very small populations and some much larger populations and with different patterns of variability. So it's through international collaboration, we've actually been able to um, begin to answer some local questions as well as some of these wider questions. So then Roberta then came to me and said, okay, I want to do something you know, these microsatellites are all well and good, but you, you, you're only working with 12. There's all these new techniques becoming available. Um, and we should sort of maybe try and do something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and so she's been using something called double digest rad sequencing, which is restriction, asso restriction site associated DNA sequencing. So uh, again, it's another long mouthful you don't need to worry about, but it's another technique which allows you to take a large number of fragments of DNA from across the whole of the genome and compare those. Um, the first thing that she had to do was back to our old friend, the problem with large genome size, because she had to, first of all, optimize this technique for plants with large genomes. And then the next thing she said, okay, if you look at the situation in Britain, we've got so few plants, it's really just a bit of a just-so story. Um, it's just, these are just the half dozen plants that happen to have survived. So let's have a look at something which is ha what's happening in sort of larger, healthier populations. So she got in contact with a colleague in Estonia where there are several very large populations. Um, and she picked two populations after discussing it with Tiu, our colleague, colleague in Estonia. One of which is a, a population on one of the islands in the Baltic, one of which is on the mainland of Estonia. They're a similar size, but one of them, the mainland one, is stable in size, whereas the one on the island has been increasing quite rapidly in size. And the question that Roberta was wanting to ask is, going back to what I said about the, the wild plants in the UK, was that we didn't want to dig it up to find out whether the two main shoots were actually one plant or two plants, because whether they were connected underground. Because of these large populations in, in Estonia, Tio had actually dug up several of these plants and she could tell you that, okay, th this is one individual and this is multiple individuals because she could show you where the rhizome was underneath. Um, she also knew how old the plants were because they have a very um, regular pattern of branching of the rhizomes and they produce a certain number of growths each year. And so she was able to say, okay, this one is 50 years old, this one's 75 years old, this one's 120 years old. And some of them were more than 100 years old. So she already knew quite a lot about the, the demographics of these populations. But what she didn't know was how much of it was happening as a result of vegetative propagation and then plants splitting off from each other and how much of it was from sexual reproduction by production of seeds and seed germination. And also, she was worried about what the effect would be on the long-term future of those populations because if there wasn't very much genetic variation being generated through sexual reproduction, then what was the effect of that going to be? And then so Roberta went off and optimized this particular new technique, um, which allows you to look not just at a dozen sites, but thousands and thousands of loci across the genome. And she optimized that for these very large genomes that we have in Cypripedium calciarius. So to s summarize, um, what the, the main questions were, then it's sort of how much genetic diversity can be maintained in a partially clonal plant where you've got this sort of, some propagation going on vegetatively and some by seed. And in a, in a general sense, populations can do three things. They can start off as large populations and they can decrease in size. They can remain stable or they can go from a small population to a large population. 
a very sort of general, um, simplistic view of the world. But when you've got this mixture of partially clonal propagation and partially sexual propagation, then this is actually a little bit too much of a simplification because you don't know whether the plants are connected underground or whether or not you've got cross-pollination and therefore sexual reproduction between different individuals going on. And so this is the question that Roberta was wanted to ask was, what was the balance between clonal or vegetative reproduction and sexual reproduction? So here's Estonia. The, the, the main part of the country is on the mainland. And then you've got several islands in the Baltic here. And so here you've got these two populations, one on the island, one on the mainland. And so from the, she went over there and did some field work, which would have been fun apart from the fact that they were <laughs> attacked by large numbers of, of ticks. <laughs> so it made it rather unpleasant, but it was, they managed to come back with, in total, about a more than 1,000 samples, so approximately 500 leaf samples from these two populations. Compare that with the six or seven samples that we would do if we did the same thing in the UK. And so with thousands of loci, what she's been able to show is that the, on the island here that you've got less genetic diversity compared with considerably more genetic diversity on the mainland. And that goes along with what our colleague Tiu's um, hypothesis was because she said we've got this old population whereas you've got this rapidly increasing population. So they've, there's been a founder event, she thought, on the island and the genetic data support that because you've got a small number of individuals to begin with which have now given rise to a large number of individuals but without very much genetic variation to begin with. Whereas you've got this old population which is made up of multiple individuals with different genetic backgrounds and so you've got a lot more genetic variation there. So. The interesting thing, though, is that this one has got a high level of sexual reproduction, so there's a lot of cross-pollination going on and seedlings being produced, and you, so you can tell that by the genetics because you end up with lots of individual plants which are genetically distinguishable from each other, even though you've got low genetic diversity overall. And it's, this is the population which is increasing in size. This one, although you've got more genetic diversity there's actually very little genetic, very little sexual reproduction going on. So there's not the p potential for producing more genetic diversity. So it's, it's not just stable in size, but it's also stable genetically at the moment. So you've got the founder event on the island, and then you've got survival of genetically distinct individuals because they live for more than 100 years if they're happy and nobody digs them up or puts them on a herbarium sheet on the mainland. So two contrasting populations. So from those data, now Roberta's... So the longevity on the, of the plants on the mainland promoted by vegetative growth is having a fundamental effect because it's maintaining that genetic diversity but it can only do that so long as the plants survive and nobody goes in and chops the forest down or uh, the plants don't die of old age um, but because there's not very much genetic very um, not very much sexual reproduction going on then there's no continuation of that maintenance of the genetic diversity it's just an artifact of the fact that these plants live for a very long time and that means that genetic diversity will eventually be lost because these plants, some of them, will eventually die. And, this, and that will, will be the result of gene flow not happening between the different individuals and generating new genetically distinct individuals. And it's also dependent on the fact that the habitat has to remain stable. And we know that not, it's not just people chopping down forests, but it's climate change and all sorts of other things that are happening. So although it's apparently, when you look at this population now, it's a very large, very healthy population, there's actually some worries about its future continuation, survival. 
So going back to the UK, um, I haven't said very much about fungi, but it's one of the things that we have niggling away in the back of our minds all the time because we worry about the fact that they're asymbiotic so that they don't have a symbiotic relationship with the fungus. And I use symbiosis in a fairly loose sense because it's not very clear what benefit the fungus gets from this relationship. The orchid clearly gets a benefit, but the fungus just ends up being eaten. Um, so it's symbiosis, not necessarily in the sense of being a mutualistic, uh, mutualistically beneficial relationship. So the, the plants that we grow for reintroduction are grown on nutrient agar without a fungus. And the reason for that is because nobody has actually managed to extract and culture a fungus from cypripedium roots, which is actually able to germinate the seeds of cypripedium. Clearly, as happens in nature, but the problem with many fungi is that you can't culture them um, or that we haven't found a way of culturing them. Um, for many of the other orchids, um, so um, bee orchids, for example, in the 1980s, colleagues who were working at Kew at the time managed to find a fungus which would make bee orchids grow like mustard and cress in cultivation. Uh, but we've never managed to be able to do that with cypripedium. So we end up with these plants which we produce, we grow them on in pots, and they've still got no fungus with them. So question then is, do the adults form mycorrhizal associations when, when we put them back out into nature? And are those fungi, if they pick up a fungus, is it the same or the same fungi that they have as seedlings if they've been produced in nature? Um, so what we still don't know is are the fungi that are needed for seed germination still present at the wild site in Yorkshire? And we don't know whether or not they're present at the reintroduction sites or the introduction sites. So that means in terms of success of more than a 30-year project, come to my concluding comments, conservation, the take-home message is conservation is a very long-term exercise. So after more than 30 years, we know that we can produce seedlings. We can put those out in the, into the wild. They'll grow, they'll flower, they'll produce more seeds. We understand enough of the genetics. We don't, know, we don't have answers to all of the questions. But we can say that all of the native plants have unique fingerprints, and therefore we can use that for tracking the parentage of any seedlings that were produced in the wild when we get to that stage. We're still not there yet. But also we can help out people who are growing these plants on if they lose the labels. We know that we can successfully put plants back into nature and that they will grow for a number of years. And that some of these plants have been back out in nature now for more than 20 years. So some things are going well. So I think we can give ourselves a tick for propagation we can give ourselves a sort of slightly hopeful tick for genetics. And then when you come to introduction, I think we, we put a, a tick, but say a question mark as well, because we don't know that they're actually self-maintaining. We don't know that they're actually functioning as they would do as truly wild plants. And we've really got very little idea about what's happening with the mycorrhizal fungi for the plants. We've got some hints that the ones which we've put back into nature as adult plants, are actually picking up fungi. Because you can, with a colleague in Germany who uses isotopes, because some fungi collect different isotopes than plants do from, from what they're absorbing by way of nutrients. So the balance between the different isotopes, if the plant has a, an isotope signature, which is more like the one that you would normally expect from a fungus, then it looks like they're getting some of their nutrition from the fungus. And with this colleague in Germany, we've done a small study where we've actually shown that some of the plants have actually got that signature of getting some of their nutrition from the fungus. And that's a mixture of isotopes of carbon, isotopes of hydrogen, isotopes of nitrogen. But we don't know whether they're all picking that up. 
which means that we don't know yet whether or not these introduced populations are actually self-sustaining because we don't know whether the seeds will actually germinate We've, because it's a long-lived species and it takes a long time to go from seed to seed through one generation. Then none of the introduction sites have had seedlings come in, coming up in them of their own accord yet, so we don't know whether they're self-sustaining. We still don't know whether the friendly that are needed for seed germination rather than for adult plant growth are present at the introduction site. And then, I don't know, can you see that word at the bottom? Or I'm losing a word at the bottom there, but it says how much, how much gardening is required. Um, because we're still having to protect them from deer, we're having to protect them from slugs and snails, and we're having to protect them from humans who want to go in there and pull them out. So, 30 years in, we're still not at the end of bringing it back from the brink in a reliably sustainable way, but we're moving in the right direction. And with that, I'd like to finish with a few acknowledgements. First of all, to the Genetic Society for inviting me to give this lecture. It's been a wonderful to see so many people in the audience and talk to people online, even though I can't see you. Um, I want to specifically thank Roberta for all the contributions that she's made to it. Um, it's been wonderful working with her for several years on this project. In memory of Sir Robert and Lady Lisa Sainsbury for the, the fact that they gave this large sum of money in the 1980s, which actually allowed us to do this, and it was a large enough sum that the work still continues. Several colleagues at Kew, Sarah San, Margaret Ramsey and Robin Cowan, who have been involved in various aspects of the propagation and the genetics work. And then two particular colleagues from Natural England, Ian and Colin. Co Colin is the now retired warden at closest to the wild site, which I'm, if I told you where it was, then you'd probably find out that I had to kill you because it's a, still a deep, dark secret. Um, but th these two have really been the driving forces behind the natural a bit, bit behind the Cypripedium Committee, which is also made up of people from the National Trust and then a whole range of different private growers and landowners and the people who go there as volunteer wardens. And so it's been a, a really interactive group and bringing in different skills and different expertises. Um, and then I really do want to thank all those people from the different countries, particularly to you who's worked with us to produce so many hundreds of samples for us. But we've also got samples from all these other countries in Europe. We couldn't do it without them. Um, life has become a little bit more difficult as a result of Brexit because one of the other things about orchids is that they're all on the appendices of CITES, which means that they are protected in terms of international trade and sending leaf samples for scientific work, even if it's for conservation activity, counts as international trade and so when we were in the European Union the European Union counted as one unit for CITES so we could so long as we had legally collected material in France or Italy or Denmark or wherever we didn't need to apply for permits to bring it back to Britain but now we have to apply for CITES export permits from all these countries that are still in the European Union and CITES import permits to bring the, into the UK. So life has become slightly more complicated so we're very grateful to the colleagues that pulled out all the stops and got us these samples before we had to leave the European Union. And with that... I'd like to finish and thank you all very much for your attention.